I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the IDF foils a potential terror attack in the West Bank. Israel is demanding that Poland fix a controversial new Holocaust bill. And we'll reveal how a father was able to secure a kidney transplant through a creative fashion choice. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. The IDF has just halted what could have been a potentially deadly terror attack on Jewish homes in the West Bank. Two Palestinian suspects were busted attempting to sneak into the Itamal community wearing what appeared to be IDF-style uniforms. One suspect was immediately detained at the scene while the other managed to flee to the nearby Palestinian village of Beit Furik. The army conducted a thorough search of the area and discovered a small cache of homemade Molotov cocktails. The army is continuing to investigate whether or not the suspects indeed plan to carry out a terror attack. The suspect who was arrested didn't have a weapon on him at the time, although he was carrying a pair of binoculars. Security forces have just made an arrest in a similar incident near the Jewish West Bank community of Efrat. Cameras caught a Palestinian man making suspicious movements on the outskirts of one of the neighborhoods. Counter-terror units and army patrol quickly apprehended the suspect, who attempted to escape once he realized he'd been spotted. The suspect has been arrested and transferred to the Shin Bet for interrogation. Germany's president has just met face to face with the King of Jordan to discuss the obstacles for Middle East peace. Jordan's King Abdullah II has reaffirmed the need for a Palestinian state with a capital in East Jerusalem, a need that German President Fink Walter Steinmeier seems to be backing up, which is a counter against President Trump's bombshell Jerusalem recognition just last month. ILTV's Aaron Porras is here with more. And my first question is what is Jordan worried about? It's actually an interesting question because the short answer is a lot. With Jordan's relationships in the, in, in the area, in the Middle East, any peace deal, be it from the United States or anybody else, would have massive implications on Jordan. So what specifically is Jordan keeping its eye out for? Uh, specifically at this point, they're looking at Trump and a United States peace deal, of course. Uh, according to Abdullah II, uh, speaking to uh, PM Hariri from Lebanon over this past weekend at the World Economic Forum, he said that Trump does have a deal, he's confident that Trump has a deal, and that that deal, despite Abbas's constant saying that he, you know, constantly saying that he has no business with the, with the United States anymore and that they have no business at the negotiating table, uh, he doesn't think Abbas is going to have much of a choice but to take it. And beyond that, he's also worried about cuts to UNRWA and how that might affect the Palestinian crisis in Jordan and Lebanon as well. Uh, I mean, we're talking about millions of Palestinians who are currently living in refugee camps that with those cuts, plus the loss of the right of return, should that peace deal actually go through, the one that he's talking about, they're stuck with millions of people suddenly that they weren't planning on having. So, and it, it actually poses an existential well, the, threat the to their country. The question is, how can a peace deal be made without two sides involved? Uh, well, we don't know. We'll have to find out. Let's check out your mm. report for some more details. Though Jordan is a major American ally in the Middle East, King Abdullah II has been wary of backing the United States' new policy shift regarding the Palestinians. Most recently, during the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland this week, he said that if the United States has indeed taken Jerusalem off the table, then Israel must be prepared to make, quote, a significant concession, end quote, to the Palestinians in exchange. A few days later, his message to Germany's president is a bit different. I think our views on, uh, on, uh, on Palestine and, and Jerusalem are, are well known to you. Uh, we do believe uh, in uh, a two-state solution with uh, Jerusalem uh, um, um, as the capital for the Palestinians of East Jerusalem. Germany, who is also a critical financier and ally of Jordan, remains adamant that a two-state solution is the only course of action. President Steinmeier himself has expressed significant doubts over whether or not Trump's controversial Jerusalem announcement actually helps that plan or harms it. You were mentioning the regional situation, not only uh, concerning, uh, concerning the relation between Palestine and, uh, and Israel, but also with regard to the future status uh, of Jerusalem. I think this will be an issue in our exchange today. 
Social media shaming is one of the biggest threats of this day and age, but how does it have an influence on businesses? The Knesset Internal Affairs Committee met earlier today to discuss its very impact on the Israeli economy. And joining us with more is the CEO of the Israeli Success Center, Elad Hadar. Thank you so much for joining us, Good Elad. So, so tell me, define this issue for us. How, I, I mean, how does social shaming affect businesses well today today we call them criminals keyboard because people hide behind the keyboard and they can just write anything that cuts, comes up to their mind right. that's the problem so you're talking about for example trip advisor or uh, you know the, facebook yeah. google whatever you know the problem is that uh, it's the small businesses that suffer the most right because, because they don't have review. the legal you yeah. know issues that they can handle the legal departments that can handle those issues mm -hmm. for them so mainly the ones that suffer are the small businesses. Interesting. And so, so how did this topic end up become, you know, coming to the forefront of the Knesset? Well, I actually saw a TV show about businesses that closed because of shaming on Facebook. And since I have a consulting company that mainly manages small businesses, I, mm -hmm. I took care of this issue and addressed actually to the government, the Knesset. And uh, Yaakov Peri, the minister, he actually approached me to go and make a committee about the subject. And so, so tell us about, you know, were there any decisions uh, made? Is there any, you know, law that's going to be implemented to deal well, with this? Well, Eitan Kavel, the minister, he actually saw to address this issue is very, very important. And we're going to promote the subject. There would be a second meeting and we're going to address the issue seriously and invest a lot of now, time. When you say seriously, is the idea to implement some, implement some kind we're of gonna, law? Or? We're going to make a law about the subject. Uh -huh. We're going to promote a law because there is a... You know, there is a big difference between criticism uh, to shaming. Right, because the free speech is clearly exactly. an, an issue that we deal with We do here. not want to block uh -huh. people from writing whatever they think, but there is a difference between that and to damaging some people's work. Interesting. Um, I mean, so I guess a question for now, until that happens, is how can small businesses protect themselves? Well, first of all, they need to engage. You know, we have a rights about you. You need to engage with that. And you need to follow the social media because you need to take it when it's still early and somebody just wrote about it. But first of all, just give a good service so you will not have any reason to complain. Well, yeah, th that's always a hope that just doing your work well will result in good reviews, right? But unfortunately, the internet is often anonymous. All right, thank you, my friend, for joining us. Elad Khadam. Thank you. All right, a leaked recording of the Israeli Prime Minister's wife, Sarah, has ignited a firestorm of controversy, though the tape appears to echo past allegations and lawsuits accusing Sarah Netanyahu of abusing employees at the Prime Minister's residence. The Israeli leader says the tape is nothing short of a full-out media witch hunt that is targeting his entire family. Sarah Netanyahu can be heard on the tape apparently enraged over a gossip column that didn't point out her status as a certified psychologist. This tape confirms years of rumors circulating in Israeli society, which include allegations of the Prime Minister's wife both verbally and even physically assaulting staff. Numerous former employees have filed lawsuits against Sarah Netanyahu along these grounds, with two former employees winning against her in 2016. This comes mere weeks after media published an incriminating recording made of the Prime Minister's son Yair, 25 at the time, allegedly during a rowdy night out to strip clubs. That's why Netanyahu says the recordings are merely more of the same media witch hunt. <laughs> אבל כשמדובר במשפחה שלי, ברעייתי, בילדיי, הכל מותר. מתירים את דמם. התקשורת מחבקת את המקליטים והמקליטות הללו, ומציגה אותם כ... 
גיבורים גדולים, אבל הם לא גיבורים. והם רומסים זכות בסיסית שיש לכל אדם, הזכות לפרטיות. Latest polls out of the United States suggest that while Republican support of Israel remains strong, Democratic numbers may be waning, specifically in its frustration of Netanyahu and his right-wing government. But here in Israel, tapes like these sometimes only play like practical jokes. Cruel for some, but for others, not cruel enough. Poland's controversial new bill that outlaws identifying Nazi concentration camps in Poland as, quote, Polish death camps is continuing to ignite fierce controversy. Prime Minister Netanyahu has demanded that Poland fix the bill immediately amidst cries that it dangerously rewrites one of the darkest chapters in human history. ILTV's Brett Allen Smith is now here with the update. Thanks, Natasha. Well, the biggest news here is that Netanyahu was on the phone with Poland's PM last night, and they've agreed to work together on amending the future version versions of this bill. Now that in itself is controversial for a couple of reasons. Knesset Chairman Yair Lapid from the Ishatid party, whose relatives were killed in Poland during the Holocaust, says Netanyahu shouldn't even be negotiating with Poland on this point at all. Now, Jewish rights groups all over the world are slamming this bill. The Pope has even alluded to the virus of indifference of Holocaust denial. What compromise can Israel and Poland really reach that will make everyone happy? Is there a compromise? I mean, frankly, I think everyone's going to be very shocked if there is one. Even though Poland and Israel are talking, a spokeswoman for the Polish government denies that these talks are really going to change the parliament's mind, which definitely puts a damper on hopes that this bill can be course corrected before it becomes Polish law, as you'll see now in my report. After intense international outrage over Poland's controversial new bill, Poland's Prime Minister has agreed to work with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to amend the legislation, which in its current form would allow Poland to jail offenders for up to three years for using the term Polish death camps. Indeed, the bill struck a personal nerve with Israeli citizens and lawmakers alike, many of whom say that the language seems to problematically absolve the Polish population of any wrongdoing during the Holocaust and Hitler's gruesome final solution. The truth is that uh, many nations, including Poles, uh, many Poles were engaged in, uh, uh, in helping the Nazis uh, murder Jews, in uh, handing them over to the Nazi authorities and in murdering Jews themselves. My own family was uh, annihilated in the Holocaust. The bill still requires further drafts before it can be ratified into law. Despite his pledge to work with Netanyahu on the next drafts, Poland's prime minister has already fiercely defended the bill as it stands, saying that neither the words Auschwitz nor those on its infamous banner at the entrance, Arbeit mach frei, are Polish. If I am to, um, just to make uh, a short statement, it would be to, to underscore that um, the intent of the law by no means is, is, is not to, 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 to whitewash the, um, the history, it is to, to, safeguard, uh, to safeguard it, to safeguard the, the truth about the, about the Holocaust and to prevent its um, distortion. This bill arrived less than 24 hours before the world commemorated Holocaust Memorial Day at the gates of Auschwitz in Poland, no less. For some, this timing, as well as its objective, marks a troubling sign of things still to come. Now, here's something unusual. An Israeli singer and songwriter is competing to perform in the Eurovision, but no, not for Israel, instead for Romania. Here's a look at his song entry, which has already made it into the finals. Joining us now is Tomel Cohen to tell us about how and why he may compete for Romania. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. No, no, this is really interesting. Are you also Romanian as well as being Israeli? No, 100% no. Israeli. 100% Israeli. So how did you end up competing or trying to compete for Romania? Um, I sent the song to the, com- to the committee of uh, of Romanians uh, Eurovision and they said to me after two hours just come to Romania in two, two hours and uh, start start the all the 
process. Really? And yeah. so and so they're opening their doors to non-Romanian singers, which is kind of unheard of in the Eurovision, right? Yeah, it's for the first time. For the first, first time, time. Yeah, they open the gates for non for non-Romanians. Which is really exciting because that gives you an opportunity. Now, I guess the the question is, uh, would did you try to represent Israel? I mean, what would it mean for you to represent Romania as an Israeli? Well, uh, I tried to represent, I sent my song first yeah. uh, in the last year uh, to the Israeli, but I never got any email, but Romania did, so it's a So really... why not, right? Yeah, why, why not? not? You can represent yeah. two countries at the same time, both Israel and Romania. Yeah. And I mean, how does that make you feel? If you were to get your song selected, that would be a huge deal. Yeah, it's 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 really nice because now the song is on the radio in, in Romania and uh, it's like opportunity because Romania is like a big country. Yeah, and, I mean this is an like opportunity the pop to music. listen. Yeah, especially in English, they're right. really into it. It's it's really interesting that um, you know the Romanians were so attracted to this style of music. Well, I mean, good luck. Obviously, I think everybody here in Israel is rooting for you as well. It would be beautiful to see Israelis performing for Israel and Israelis performing for Romania. So. Yeah. So congratulations anyhow that you made it to the finals. Thank you. All right, the French city of Nice is famous for its gorgeous location on the French Riviera, but it's about to become known for another pretty amazing reason as well. Nice is the first to test a new citywide Israeli app to help citizens instantly report crime from anywhere at any time. The Israeli-made app, which is called Reporty, will link up millions of French civilians to both the local police as well as nearly 1,700 CCTV security cameras throughout the city. Une fois que l'application est téléchargée, la personne va signer une charte et à ce moment-là, elle recevra un code secret et confidentiel de façon à être, pouvoir entrer en contact directement avec le centre de supervision par un simple clic sur le téléphone. Ça lance automatiquement une géolocalisation de la plan et une vidéo en streaming. That means as soon as a crime is spotted, users just activate the application on their phone and police will instantly be able to spot their location and see the crime in progress. Nous sommes la ville de France la plus vidéo surveillée puisque nous avons aujourd'hui 1700 caméras et malheureusement ça n'a pas empêché l'attentat du 14 juillet. Donc depuis, je pense que la La sensibilité de Christian Estrosi par rapport à ces questions s'est encore exacerbée. Et donc le résultat, c'est cette application qu'il a été chercher en Israël dans la, la start-up de, des Hauts de Barak. The luxurious city of Nice is frequently targeted for all kinds of crimes, so local police are very hopeful that reporting might help them with the overload. Elle a pour but cette application de nous aider à gérer euh, les appels téléphoniques que nous recevons au centre de supervision, c'est-à-dire on gère quand même 75 000 appels téléphoniques par an. Euh, et ces appels téléphoniques, la difficulté pour nous, c'est souvent de savoir la position euh, des appelants pour pouvoir diriger les équipages dessus et puis avoir des informations euh, le plus précises, les plus précises possible. An Israeli app fighting crime in Nice, that's pretty nice if you ask us. All right, a newborn Syrian refugee has just been airlifted from an Israeli hospital, but this time for a very, very happy reason. Israeli doctors have corrected a serious congenital heart defect, meaning the baby should hopefully live a long and healthy life. The infant was born to Syrian refugees in Cyprus back in December, but just days after his birth, he was flown to Israel for critical treatment. Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs coordinated with the Cyprus Ministry of Health to bring the sick baby over to the country for surgery. And Israeli Interior Minister Ali Adeli was quick to allow the infant and its father to enter Israel. The Syrian baby was treated at the Sheba Medical Center's Edmund and Lily Safra Children's Hospital, a medical facility that constantly receives patients with some of the most complex health problems all over the world. This little infant is scheduled to return to the Israeli hospital when he is six months old to finish the treatment for his condition. It looks like Arab enrollment in Israeli universities is the highest it's ever been. The number has spiked an impressive 78% over the last seven years, and this comes after years of work by Israel's Council for Higher Education to integrate Arabs into Israeli academia. So far, it's clearly paying off in a big way.
As of last year, Arab students made up a little over 16 percent of all undergrads in Israeli universities, a massive jump up from only 10.2 percent in 2010. The stats are even more encouraging when looking at grad programs where Arab enrollment has more than doubled from 6 to 13 percent in that same time frame. Integrating Arab students into Israeli higher education has been a long-time priority for the government. The Knesset's already pumped nearly $88 million into this program since 2000. Given these awesome statistics, it's no wonder they're extending a new batch of funding until 2022, greenlighting a total budget upwards of $294 million. Enrollment numbers for Bedouins in the country are still down, however, but that's why the council has also just approved a new five-year plan similar to the one that boosted Arab enrollment to hopefully bring Bedouin students to the school desk as well. Everybody loves going on vacation, but let's be honest, it gets stressful when you start factoring in all of the cost, flights, food, and of course, hotels. Well, one Israeli company called Casa Versa is offering a totally different solution for housing when you travel abroad. And joining us now is Yariv Gilad, the founder and CEO. Hello. Hello, Natasha. All right, so you offer house swapping. Tell us about how this works. Absolutely. Casa Versa is a home swapping service. It offers a platform for people all over the world wanting to go on vacation and it enables them to swap their houses and get rid of the accommodation bill entirely. This enables them to travel much long, uh, tr much more often yeah. and stay much longer. So and, and how do you know how how do the I guess how does a platform work? How are people able to find each other and be able to trust that they're going to a nice home, vice versa, that the person who's coming to their home isn't going to touch their stuff? Per right. se. So it's very simple. You know, it's uh, not very different from a dating site. Yeah. Like you go online, uh, you search for something that uh, appeals to you. You build trust uh, gradually. You start chatting with the person. You build your own profile. You have a look at their uh, reviews. Yeah. Uh, you start chatting to them. Uh, you coordinate a video conference call. And you see, so you're really able to kind yeah. of gauge if this is somebody that you're comfortable with with making the switch with. So, so yes, you know, the key, the key, uh, sorry, the key aspect is trust, right? How to build trust between. Uh, well, well, that's people. why I wanted to ask you yeah. what makes this platform different from other house swapping platforms right. because you know this does exist. It absolutely, does exist. absolutely. A home exchange has been around for 60 years. Okay, so how are we different from other websites? Well, first of all, we're completely free. There's absolutely no cost involved so in using So how much money are you saving using your platform? Well, uh, on average, we save more than $4,000 uh, a family on a typical family vacation. That's unbelievable. Yes. Uh, and that enables uh, people to triple their time on vacation and stay twice as much. Most people stay twice as much. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's enough of a reason for people to want to use your platform, Yariv. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us and telling us about this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. It looks like fashion may have more of an impact than we previously thought. A father of five who visited Disney World wearing a T-shirt that said, in need of kidney, has just received a life-saving transplant from a stranger. Talk about a slick wardrobe decision. All jokes aside, the Jewish father of five, Robert Leibowitz, had been waiting for a new kidney for decades. The 60-year-old works in advertising and using his background, he came up with the idea to create a t-shirt asking for help that he could wear on every day of his family vacation to Disney World. The shirt listed his blood type and a phone number to call to provide assistance. Well, that phone number ended up getting more calls than Leibowitz could imagine, and soon enough, medical tests narrowed the donor pool down to a man from Indiana who was found to be a perfect match. 39-year-old Richie Soli was happy to donate, saying he, quote, just saw a father that wanted to spend more time with his kids. I think we can all believe in humanity again. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. One Jewish dad has just made a fashion choice that literally saved his life with a kidney transplant. So today we're talking about the kilia, aka your kidney. Well, as we all know, the kilia or kidney is so important that you're born with a backup. Yep, typically everyone's born with two working kiliot or kidneys. But did you know that if you're only born with one kilia, it'll grow twice as big and weigh the same as if you had two? The truth is you actually don't need that extra kilia. One is usually enough to do the trick, but drink lots of water and take care of those kiliot. More blood flows through your kilia in a day than even your brain or your liver. 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast on that note. Tonight should be partly cloudy to cloudy with local showers in the north and, and center and a low of roughly 47 or 8 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow is expected to be partly cloudy with little to no change in temperatures and a high of about 63 or 17 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.4 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.